Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. Gothic 3 is an open world action RPG from 2006. If you're following my channel, you probably know this is one of my most favorite games ever basically. The most important thing is always from back to front. Once you know how to do it, it's no problem. In 2021 I did a full retrospective video for this game, so I highly suggest checking that out if you want to hear my in-depth thoughts. In this video, however, I'm going to mention a couple of strong reasons why I believe that this game was way ahead of its time. So even if you didn't like this game for whatever reason, you might come to agree with me on some of these points. Anyway, let's not waste too much time on the intro and start talking about the game. Damn it! And me hoping this wouldn't get too complicated. If you come back to this game today, or if you play it for the first time ever, you could probably see that it's a pretty old game. But graphically, there are many parts of the game that stood the test of time. Not because of the graphical fidelity itself, even though that aspect of the game deserves some praise as well. I was playing the game recently in 4K resolution and most of the textures look really crisp. But the biggest reason why this game still looks really pretty to look at is the world itself. The whole map of the game was hand-built, which means there is no random generation for any assets. Each tree, plant, ground clutter and many other static objects were placed manually and where it makes sense. And speaking about trees, there is an impressive amount of unique tree textures. That means when you're exploring the woods of Murtana, which is one of the three big zones in the game, you'll see a lot of unique looking trees. It's really easy to see they are not just copy and pasted, even though you will find some same looking trees in general. But even so, the amount of unique trees you're going to see in the woods makes this place very authentic. One thing is for certain, it's far away from being just a generic forest area in an open world RPG. The ground clutter is equally impressive for that time period and there are many unique plants all over the map. Even though all of this was really impressive, it didn't really help the game's performance which was already quite poor. Primarily because the game was clearly not finished when it came out, and it even had game-breaking bugs. But that's a totally different discussion. The size of the map itself is very big, with three different biomes to explore. That makes the created by hand part even more impressive. What's even more impressive, they managed to create this huge open world with no loading screens. That's not exactly impressive by today's standards, but it was very impressive back in 2006. Especially because every asset in the world was hand placed and you could really tell that by just exploring it. Gothic 3 has 20 major locations on the map which include 16 actual cities and 4 smaller village like places. Creating an open world environment where you can seamlessly enter and leave these big locations on the map with no interruptions is a huge deal if you ask me. I personally think this is essential for creating an immersive experience. And while immersion can be highly subjective, the technical aspect behind this design of the world is objectively impressive. I remember when Witcher 3 came out in 2015 and it was heavily praised for the open world with almost no loading screens. So this was impressive even in 2015, yet alone in 2006 when Gothic 3 came out. I think 2015 was the breaking point when it comes to huge open worlds with no load screens and The Witcher 3 was just the beginning. Shortly after that, we started seeing a lot more action adventures and RPGs with huge open worlds with few or no load screens at all. Anyway, besides those 20 locations that are marked on the map, there are of course a lot of unmarked areas to explore and you'll never get to see a loading screen in Gothic 3. Huge caves, a lot of interiors, etc etc. Only when you use a teleportation stone, but even that can be instant if your game is on the SSD. I would say this was extremely impressive back then and definitely ahead of its time. Speaking about the world design, I found it amazing how the game manages to guide the player with no actual quest marks on the map. I think this speaks a lot about the brilliant design of the world map. If this was just a generic open world map with randomly generated terrain, it would be nearly impossible to create content like this. You would spend hours trying to find your quest objectives if the world map itself wasn't designed around this philosophy. But there is never a moment in Gothic 3 where you won't be able to find or just stumble upon the quest objective by just exploring the map. It's kinda hard to explain exactly what I mean, this makes a lot more sense when you start playing the game. At first, it can feel really weird when you start doing this quest because the directions you get from NPCs are usually quite vague. 
Well, actually, we discovered an orc camp not too far from here. But this quickly changes as soon as you start exploring the map. In my retrospective video, I had some negative things to say about the quests themselves. On the surface, a lot of them just seem like simple fetch quests and busy work. And while that's not too far away from the truth, there is a lot more to it. The game has an exceptional way to subtly guide the player to more content. The example I gave in that retrospective video still holds up really well, so I'll just quickly go over it. There is a very simple fetch quest that you can do for the innkeeper in Monterra. He tells you to go to the second Monterra farm and collect some wheat. Then you go there and start collecting them all over the farm, but you'll notice that you won't have the exact number of wheat to complete the quest. If you start talking with people on the farm, you'll find out that bandits attacked the farm and took the wheat. Then you start looking for the bandits and when you eventually find them, you need to kill them and collect the rest of the wheat. If you're curious enough, you'll be able to find a huge cave behind their camp, which has some really strong monsters and you probably have to come back later when you get stronger. This would be a very boring quest if the game had quest marks and a generic open world map. And again, it's kinda hard to put this into words, it's a lot more apparent when you start playing the game. The next point I want to bring up is large-scale battles. There is usually a huge disparity between the narrative and the gameplay in open-world RPGs, and a lot of games in general, especially when it comes to wars or any kind of large-scale battles. A lot of games will try to get you excited about these quote-unquote huge battles, but they usually turn out to be 5 on 5 or in the best case scenario, 10 versus 10 NPCs on the screen at once, and even that is kinda rare to be honest. And like I said, that can create a huge disparity between the narrative and the gameplay. Gothic 3 can have a huge amount of NPCs on the screen at once. There are situations where you can cause a huge scale fight with many NPCs on the screen. But you can also provoke a fight at any given moment, which will cause almost all NPCs around you to turn hostile. Big cities in the game have a huge amount of NPCs, so when you attack someone alone or with some friends, it truly seems like a full-blown war. Unfortunately, once again, this also means the performance will tank in those situations. Even very beefy PCs of today can struggle in these situations, so you can probably imagine how PCs from 2006 used to perform. So that definitely takes away some points from this argument, but still, you have to admit this is really impressive. Nowadays, it's a lot more common to see big scale fights, but they're usually very scripted. I'm not saying that's fundamentally bad, but I personally prefer a sandbox approach to open world design. Especially when it comes to fights that the player can provoke at any given moment. Leave me alone! But just in general as well, I think the sandbox design gives the player a lot more freedom of action when it comes to the gameplay. So yeah, you can create a total mayhem in this game. Out of here, Mora. Right wow. now. Even more of the <laughs> One of my most favorite things to do is to pull a lot of enemies close to the city and create a huge fight. The last thing I want to mention is not exactly related to the main argument of this video, but I really want to talk about it. Because it would be a crime not to mention the amazing music and the atmosphere of this game. The music is the main reason for such an amazing atmosphere that this game creates. And if you're watching my videos on a regular basis, you probably got used to listening to some parts of this amazing soundtrack. The high fantasy soundtracks really fits the visuals and the general atmosphere of Gothic 3. Kai Rosenkrantz, the composer of this soundtrack, had already established himself as a great composer even before Gothic 3. The first two Gothic games had a much darker atmosphere in general and the soundtracks were closely following that design philosophy. They were amazing as well, there is no doubt about it. But the soundtrack in Gothic 3 was definitely his magnus opus. And that would be it for this video, I guess. It was a nice excuse to talk about this game again, but I think the reasons why it was ahead of its time are quite valid. And as always, you can tell me if you agree or disagree in the comments below. And tell me what other game was way ahead of its time, in your opinion. Leave a comment down below. 
don't forget to subscribe for more RPG contents. If you want to support the channel in the long run, consider becoming a Patreon or a YouTube member. You can get your name on the end credits as well as some other perks like early access to videos, Discord roles, my plans for future content, etc. etc. That'll be all, and I'll see you in the next one.